Hey there, my name is Eric Bonn. I'm one of the co-founders at Hustle Fund, which is an early stage venture capital firm based in San Francisco and Singapore. And I'm really excited to be here on the Ivy podcast. Thank you so much, John, for letting me be here. Eric, thanks so much for making time to join us on the Ivy podcast today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. And before we you know, jump straight into the meat of this, talk about the venture investing and you know the Hustle Fund, all of that great stuff, Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, kind of the thumbnail version of your career to date. Certainly. Um, well, so I'm the son of Korean immigrants. So my parents are ethnically Korean. They arrived to the United States and landed in Michigan in the 1970s. So I was actually born and raised in Michigan on the west side of Detroit, a town called Bloomfield Hills. So had a nice, boring, lovely, it's very safe childhood out there in the Midwest. And then was very fortunate to actually uh, come out to California for college. So I attended Stanford. And as I like to say, all the women that I'm currently growing old with, I actually met in the very first week of college. So I met my wife in the very first hour of college. She was my neighbor in my dorm room. Uh, So that was nice. And then I met Elizabeth uh, in a math class a little bit later that week. And then she and our third general partner, who is based in Singapore, uh, I met, I think, at a party that week as well. So we're all very close and literally growing old together. Um, you know, each of us um, has kids that are similar age, boy and a girl. We're really close to each other's spouses. And I'd say that this is one of the best lottery tickets that God ever gave me was just like as a relatively young man, being able to meet these incredible women and do work with them. So out of college, uh, I spent some time as a product manager learning how big companies work at Intuit. On the side, I was bootstrapping and then later went full-time on an education media company, which I then ran with my wife for nine years. So wonderful experience building a social network, learning how to um, learn, learn how media businesses work. Sold that in 2012 to the Daily Mail Group, which is a big media business based out of London. I was there for a little bit. Uh, after that, helped to uh, start another media business with Elizabeth, my current co-founder at Hustle Fund. Uh, that was a really fun journey. It worked out very well. And then had a brief period of time, about two years, working at Facebook and Instagram, which felt like graduate school education and learning how top-tier product management worked and what product, re- true product leadership worked. So we started... Um, uh, so after, I guess, uh, the, that stint at Facebook and Instagram, I was very interested in starting another business. And I went back to my old friend, Elizabeth Yin, my current co-founder. At the time, she was running the 500 Startups Accelerator, which is a notable accelerator program here in the San Francisco Bay Area and also globally. And she invited me in as an entrepreneur residence on her team. That's when I actually fell in love with the business of venture. And it was from our conversations uh, from doing the work at 500, uh, which inspired us around the model behind Hustle Fund. So in 2017, we broke off and and started Hustle Fund. And it's actually rooted on a very, very simple thesis. After doing lots and lots of investments, um, we found that uh, the very best leading indicator of success that we could discern, even at the early stages of company formation, is this quality called hustle. So for us, hustle is defined as great execution meets high velocity. And we found that teams that just measure well um, with really high throughput of work, high quality of execution, week after week, month after month, year after year, tend to just grind out the best businesses over time. But in order for us to see hustle, we have to work with the teams. So in our model, what we do is a little bit unusual. We'll start with a really fast $25,000 check, which we can usually write within one meeting of the team. If we think that the ideas are exciting, We'll then work with the team on growth projects for 48 weeks, usually related to sales or user acquisition. And it's through that execution where we can do like a two-way due diligence. We can get a better sense of the team's hustle, learn more about the market. And those teams can actually learn about us to see whether we're actually adding real value. And if we find that after this process that there's really uh, lots of trust that's been built, we're both excited about, about the market being served, we respect each other's hustle, then we'll participate in future financing rounds with much larger checks between $100,000 to $750,000 to make those businesses a core position within our fund. So I think there's a really cool mantra that we have in our fund that we deeply believe in, which is that great hustlers look like anyone and come from anywhere. And it turns out that when you focus on hustle as your core criteria, you create natural diversity. So it's about 40% women at our fund in terms of the founders we back. 27% underrepresented groups, more than 60% of our deals are now outside of Silicon Valley. It just looks more and more like the population of the United States that we serve every day, as well as our other markets. 
So um, that's uh, kind of like a, the mission behind Hustle Fund. It's like we think that inclusivity is actually a lever for maximum capital gain. It's not this virtuous, virtuous signal thing, but actually a way to actually make a lot of money and helping uh, make the ecosystem feel more inclusive and diverse over time. So that's me. And that's a bit about Hustle Fund, John. Wow, that's super cool. You just threw a lot at us. And I'm going to try to dissect it a little bit. A little oh, yeah, let's do it. Um, very impressive background. First of all, congrats on all the success. Thank you. you. Know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to, to follow that. You, you've done, uh, you know, to, from the founder operator, uh, go back to a little bit of a corporate uh, experience and then go into the, to the investor side, which is kind of, from my perspective, was kind of similar, but maybe a little bit opposite. I was in the corporate sector for a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. Then I started my own thing, multiple startups, uh, failed most of them, had one successful one, more or less. Uh, and now I'm just dabbing into the kind of the angel investing side, just yeah. you know, from that perspective, taking the lessons learned from those journeys and really helping that kind of the next wave of the founders and entrepreneurs from that perspective. So that's very interesting what you were talking about and what you've mentioned kind of from the hustle perspective resonates on so many levels yeah. because at the end of the day, it's, it, it's, it has nothing to do with anything in particular, like with your, with demographics or anything perspective, it's more of a, not really a personality, but you're also the attitude towards things. How, how do you go about creating something? How do you go about yeah. Uh, building something. So that's, I want to dive a little bit further into that. But before that, um, tell us a little bit about the journey when you, I believe you approached your friend, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned, and you guys decided it's kind of, let's take that experience at 500 startups and kind of branch off and build something of our own when it comes to the venture fund. Tell us a little bit about that experience. How do, how do, what, what was the process like? What were some of the decisions made? And more importantly, how hard was that process raising that fund, especially the first one? Yeah, um, happy to dive into all that and give you the non-BS uh, perspective here. So uh, as I mentioned, Elizabeth and I have been friends for quite some time and just to introduce her a little bit. Like she's also a, a, an outstanding operator. So uh, worked at Google, she, um, had her own ad tech company, which she sold in 2014, had a great exit out of that, <clears throat> and um, has been a really active angel investor. And the thing that I really love about uh, Elizabeth is if you ever have a chance to to connect with her, John, or any of your listeners do, you realize that she puts her heart on her sleeve and never lies or like hides about hides anything that she's feeling. Like she's just so direct and unapologetically herself that um, it's it's some some ways both awkward as well as endearing of just like just like who she is and it's it's really wonderful to be her colleague and to learn from her all the time. So when me and Elizabeth were at 500 Startups, she was the lead partner behind the accelerator program during the time that she was there, and I think that you know early on we discovered we we kind of realized that we wanted to go back into business together we had some experiences and some sex, success before it'd been a few years since we had collaborated but uh, we're excited by that prospect and what we were realizing when we were at 500 startups was an opportunity to I think evolve something that we were learning in the accelerator experience so when you're at 500 startups or any accelerator program itself, the investment model is sort of similar. Like uh, the decisions are generally done pretty quickly as well, one to two or three meetings to invite people to come to the accelerator. And when you're a founder in the accelerator, that's when a bunch of work starts to happen. You meet with them, the uh, the VC team, investment team, growth teams at Fiverr Startups, meet with these founders on a weekly basis. And you actually can see and track the work over time. And what we were discovering was, you know, usually after two or three months, there'd be a demo day at 500 startups or like a Y Combinator. And that was a big investor showcase where people could raise money. But at Hustle Fund, or sorry, for me and Elizabeth, we were realizing it doesn't actually take you that long to realize the true hustlers. It just actually takes you like a couple of weeks. And actually, John, in your experiences, you know, you're an operator for quite some time. I'm sure you've hired, fired lots and lots of people in your career. And I doubt that you needed like a year or even like several months to know like this person seems to be someone that can be a stellar operator 
Um, and sometimes like they surprise you too. Perhaps it's not like the person who has a Harvard MBA, but the person that has like more of like the, the scraggly kind of uh, checkered background, who is like your true operator, but you can see it in the course of the work. So when we are starting to like really solidify this thesis that it's not actually taking us that long, it's taking us like about a month really to see these people who are emerging as the true hustlers or not. Like um, we almost felt like, you know, it's not necessarily almost like from the investor's perspective, actually to like do the rest of the, the program, because you kind of identified who the true winners we think are going to be uh, pretty early on <clears throat> just from working with these teams. So we are really inspired by that. We are also kind of starting to get a little bit negative on this idea of demo days. They can work out really great for, for certain founders, but the trick is that not every team is ready for a demo day by the time the demo day arrives. It's like an arbitrary point in time. It's like founders, John and Eric, they come into the accelerator three months on this date. They have to start raising. We may not be ready. And it's not to say it's a poor business, but it's just the timing is off. So it always felt like we were pushing a square peg into like a round hole for a lot of businesses. And for those who are ready, like it was a great process, of course, too. So we wanted to discard that, basically distill down some of the things that we really, really liked about the accelerator, like adding value through helping with growth help, um, you know, um, doing these kinds of one-on-one -on -one coaching, just like seeing the work through the execution and trying to operationalize that into hustle funds. So that's exactly what we did was uh, take some of that inspiration. And to 500's credit too, they taught us another really important lesson, which was this idea around diversity and inclusion. So they're very early on the DEI messaging for the fund, as well as investing globally. But their take on it was always, I thought, very special, which was like, like uh, you know, there's a lot of bias right now in Silicon Valley, at least institutionally, that favors like men, primarily white Asian men who went to Stanford and all that stuff. And you can sort of see that in the dollars that are being directed to those founders. And that's fine. Like some of them are really great. Not all of them, though. <clears throat> but it's sort of ignoring this other population of people who are insane hustlers who are also going for like unicorn ambition. And um, I think from like a capitalist perspective, it's just like, why would you ignore this unbelievable talent? Uh, let's include them into our, our, our uh, practices as investors. 500 is very, very early in understanding this, especially going beyond geographies past the United States. So that, that deeply inspired us. So we broke off in um, 2017 to begin Hustle Fund and begin our journey. And we had a very simple strategy when it came to the fundraising process. I can summarize in two words for you, John. It was brute force. So we knew that we weren't coming from Sequoia. 500 is great, but it didn't have the brand clout of like even like a Y Combinator. So we had to uh, rely on volume to actually put together the race. So some of the, so we talked to about 700 prospective investors and ended up closing I think about 71 of them, so 10% over the course of nine months. It was just an exhaustive just process of finding lots of leads, talking to everyone. And the definition of investor in our, in our team was is really varied. Some of it was family offices, and we talked to some institutions. No one bit for the first fund, at least. But we went everywhere. Like when, when Elizabeth was getting her eyes checked by her optometrist, she was pitching the optometrist. In fact, she pitched the optometrist twice, one for fund one, one for fund two. The guy said no both times, <laughs> but like, you know, anyone that we thought was rich that would be interested in participating in this journey, um, uh, you know, we, we just talked to them and some of the checks were as small as $10,000. Our largest check were a couple million bucks. It was a wide range, but our view was just like, we will just fill this funnel as, as much as we can just by having as many top of funnel leads as possible and just outwork this process. Even still, our fund one was relatively modest. It was $11.5 million. But it allowed us to prove our model, gave us lots and lots of momentum for fund two, which is, I think, a little bit easier. And hopefully fund three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth will be building upon that momentum too. Um, I'm not sure if I covered all of your questions there, but let me pause to see if you have <laughs> clarifiers or reactions to anything I shared so far. No, I love that. And just reminds very similar of the, you know, the founder journey as we go through the process of fundraising for the startups. It's a full-time job that never ends, right? It's the same thing you told that optometrist story. And what I remember when I was fundraising for my startups, it was also 24 seven, it doesn't yeah. matter, whoever you meet, you pitch, <laughs> you talk to them. It's, that's the, you know, that, that type of hustle that never ends. So that's pretty exciting to hear that type of, you know, the process that you guys actually went through forming the, the fund itself. 
Yeah, but I mean, one comment about this too, and John, you might have found this in your experiences too, when in the businesses that you are running, is um, I find the fundraising process actually to be enormously satisfying, even when I don't get, even when in situations where I can't close, the perspective that I have is like. I'm selling you a product that I deeply believe in and I think is good for you to participate in, right? And like what I noticed about like some of the founders who get really at ease with fundraising is they just have convinced themselves that what they're doing is actually great for the world, great for anyone who is signing up as an employee or an investor, but also great for themselves too. Yeah. And you can just tell in the quality of their pitch about the, this passion. So it, it's um, a long time ago. I was sort of like at a rock concert or something. I was like, man, don't these people get tired of singing the same ass songs like <laughs> for like 20 years or something, but I kind of get it now. It's just like, you know, um, it, it, you know, they do it, I think, because they just see the response and have like the ability to like, I guess, like project their joy in terms of this, in terms of this like really unique product that they created. So I can understand why singing, you know, um, you know, under the bridge for Red Hot Chili Peppers, like 30 years in a row is actually really appealing to them. Anyway, I just wanted to respond to that because I'm, I'm sure you felt moments of that too in your journey too. Yeah, no, no, no absolutely. And that resonates on so many levels. Um, all right. Well, I mean, that, that's pretty exciting. And, and at the same time, you've mentioned that the, the journey forming a fund, you know, on so many levels, it's, it's like, it's basically, you know, a startup on its own where you, yeah. have, you know, go through pretty, pretty much similar process where you put together, you know, the pitch deck and you meet with anybody who would listen. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, a friend of mine recently said, are you, are you selling painkillers or are you a painkiller or are you a vitamin? At the end of the day, that analogy resonated with me on so many levels because, if you identify a particular pain and you're able to cater to that as a pain mm -hmm. and alleviate that, I think you'll have a much greater success rate in terms of getting at least the attention of people that, you know, would be interested in that. So I just thought I, you know, I just throw that out there. Um, on the other spectrum, when I'm pretty sure when you were a founder of your startup, you mentioned for eight, nine years, I believe you're running your company um, and you were dealing with investors of your own, there's that, there's a sentiment when it comes to a value add investor, right? When we when we look at the founder community and we look at the investor community, we get different perspectives, and it's it's an ongoing thing that never you know that never seems to shift the pendulum into one direction. Um, my take on that is when I was a founder and I was working with investors, it was all about just me deriving the value out of the investors that mm. I needed. There was never an expectation that. Oh my God, the investor is going to come and just help me just blow up my business sure. you know, out of nowhere. So it was just that mental framework that I had to subscribe to make sure that I don't lose my mind when dealing with investors. Share with us your thoughts on the overall concept of the value add investor. How do you approach that? What have you seen actually work in your practice? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think a very important one for your listeners to consider as well. So I think the thing that got me really excited to speak with you today, John, is you represent, I think, exactly where investment on the VCN needs to head. You know, someone who's a successful operator has gone through the hustle experience a couple of times, um, just really can serve as like a very empathetic sounding board of just like understanding how difficult and lonely this journey is, but also really rewarding too, right? So the definition I think of value add is rapidly changing because there's more folks like you and me who are operators turning to VC in this ecosystem. I think it's serving as a really good um, model actually for, for founders today. So in the past, I'd say like VCs were essentially commodities. It was just like, I can get cash here, I can get cash here, I can get cash here. It's all the same, a dollar is a dollar and the VCs aren't gonna do jack shit, right? I mean, and that's like actually still sadly, I think the norm from a lot of the founders I talked to who receive like downstream fundraisers, it's just like they they promise a lot these VCs, but they didn't really do as much as I hoped. Um, uh, but I think that the social contract is changing. So in our view, there's a few ways I think that we want to position our, our own value. The first is actually serving as a, a platform to actually teach growth. So at Hustle Fund, what we do is we try to writer checks at the pre-seed stage. So our most common co-investors are like your mom and dad, uh, other angels, 
It indexes a little bit more towards first time founders too, who haven't quite developed their mental models of what good looks like. You know, what does good look like in terms of recruiting good candidates or running a good sales pipeline process and so forth. So, you know, we, we have actually put together a secret school on growth that's only available to our portfolio. It's called Redwood School that distills in like a kind of a cohort learning model, um, all the best practices that we've learned as uh, sales leaders and our experiences in starting selling and sol- uh, starting starting scaling and selling companies um, as founders ourselves on the partnership. So every partner has had that experience before. So that's one area which is just you know we want to distill great great mental models of what good looks like. So like I keep saying mental models a lot. This is actually something that is a very very leveraged thing that investors can provide. You know when you're early on, 23 year old founder, whatever you know, just beginning your journey. It's kind of hard to tell like who's a good engineer and who's a bad engineer, and you will and you have to ultimately make that uh, realization through mistakes, and 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 some luck too. But there are certain things that are just like straight up red flags <laughs> that um, you know in our experiences we can sort of save people six months to do. So for, when I think about uh, our value add, a lot of it a lot of it generally comes down to saving time and runway. It's just like when you're running this fundraise process. I'm looking at your deck, it looks horrible. So let's fix these things up. I, there, I just saved like three months of pain, right? Or if it's just like, you're running this uh, customer acquisition process, you know, the way that the campaign is set up, it looks totally wrong to me. So I've just saved you three months of runway, you know? It's, it's just these kinds of edges that, that we really care about. But I think there's a different kind of social contract here too that of good value add investors should provide, especially in the early stages, a little bit less so later on, which is the emotional support. So we think that the biggest killer uh, of early teams, uh, not just co-founder breakup, but is, is also just like giving up, you know, just like feeling that this is too lonely, too hard. And I've had those moments in every single business I've ever run, even the ones that felt good of just like, I just feel like I'm on an island here and I, I'm like breaking down, right? <clears throat> so those are difficult moments, but if you can establish trust as an investor, just like, I'm not here to judge you. And I actually think that frankly, this is what winning looks like is, is sometimes just understanding that there's these horrible, horrible troughs, but I understand it, right? Because I've been there. Um, I can't tell you how many times I feel like that kind of just listening skill and empathy can sometimes help those founders push through those difficult moments where they can get like a little bit more energy back to keep on hustling and not giving up. So that's something that we talk about a lot in our team is just trying to like understand like what's the mental health of some of these founders so that it's never like perfect, frankly, like almost everyone is like kind of depressed in some, some ways because you're on this journey, which is depressing, which is being a founder. It's just so hard, but um, making sure that we can provide some sort of like small semblance of a lifeline to listen. And I have to say, it's a really, really joyful way of living life because it just feels like we're never bullshitting each other. It's not like me approaching investor John being like, yeah, we're crushing it like every meeting and just kind of like faking it till you make it to some degree, sometimes it's necessary, but I don't, but like, it's more fun when it's just like, I got these three problems. They're really big. And I just could use your help in trying to like brainstorm how to unblock them. That's a way better, way better social contract and relationship. And that's what we aspire for. And our fund and probably what you do in your angel investing practice and what a lot of our peers are starting to do now too, especially those who are operators turning into angels or VCs. It's a very exciting time to be in this space. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you know, that resonates on so many levels. And one of my mentors says, you know, said this one thing that I still utilize on a daily basis when I talk to a lot of founders is don't be a parent to a founder, be a friend. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's, do we have that relationship between you and I as an investor and the founder to be able to go grab a drink and talk about all the problems that you're dealing with? Because at the end of the day, we're going to be attached at the hip probably for the next at least 10 years. Yeah. And if we can't have that relationship together, I think it's going to be very, very tough for your company to grow and for me to actually to be helpful. Uh, so that's just kind of like my two cents into that process. But overall, you've mentioned the rounds kind of from the founder perspective, um, being able, you know, to also be very coachable from that standpoint to understand that you're not perfect. You're not, you know, you're not a jack of all trades, a master of none. At the end of the day, it's also for you to drive that initiative for you to identify what type of value you need from the investors that you actually get to partner with. That's right. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, I guess there's almost like an implied also, um, Another criteria I think that we need to sort of address, which is, you know, I don't want to work with any assholes, 
right? And that founder shouldn't either for the reason you just cited. If it's going to be a 10 year relationship, and even if professionally it makes sense, but we just hate each other or just don't like spending time with each other, why would you invite that kind of pain? I mean, even if this is the next Uber or Facebook, yeah, I mean, I'd love to make a crazy amount of money, but it may not be worth it, you know, just because like it's, we have 247 companies, right? And hustle funds one and two. By and large, everyone's awesome. There's like a handful that are a little bit troublesome. And frankly, they take up more mental share than I'd like to met, admit. And it's the same for uh, founders, right? Which is just like, man, like if you have someone that's bad on your cap table, that's just like, feels like cortisol spikes the moment that you sign on with him. It's, it's like literally physically killing you, right? The, the, the moment you jump on that person. So I think not being an asshole is a not talked enough, but absolutely critical criteria that has to pass the filter ideally yeah no i love that it seems so simple yet often times overlooked you know in the sense that if you're not gonna have fun as well it's it's gonna be really really challenging to make something grow uh which leads me to to another point i want to discuss with you uh we've talked a lot about founders so those early indicators of that founder market fit or just the overall the type of founder that you you tend to invest in um from my perspective it starts very early. It starts for me kind of following those digital breadcrumbs of the potential founder, looking at what have they done early stage? What have they done? Not only high school, but in college days, uh, did you join the club or did you build a club? Uh, or the whole analogy of, you know, the cartographer versus the navigator. I use that a lot. Like, are you following the map or are you actually writing something that others will follow? So mm -hmm. those initiatives kind of, they, they help me identify those very, very early indicators if we match up on, on some of these levels. Tell us a little bit about your strategy, some of your, I realize it's a very loaded question, but yeah. some of the things that really help you as soon as you meet the founders, uh, what are some of the things that you look for that really help you identify that, yeah, this is something that I want to get involved with further? That's a great question. Actually, I sort of have two responses for you. One is me as an individual angel, because I do some side angel investing in non-hustle fund kind of sectors. And then uh, and then there's hustle fund itself, which is actually a bit different. So for me as an angel investor, I don't make that many angel investments and they have to be non-software for the most part, but uh, it's basically just my friends, right? It's just like, you know, if I've had a chance to work with them in the past to see that hustle firsthand, or even if I haven't, but I just know them so well and I can get a pretty decent sense that like they're really good at building and like, you know, in all aspects, not just product, but also company building, recruiting, all that stuff, then I'm comfortable making like an investment on behalf of the family, right? It's a little bit different at Hustle Fund because um, we're, we're, we, because we are fund and we have a lot more resources, we can do some special things. So I do care to some degree seeing that you have some history of building but it's actually not as important to me yet. I mean, if we think that the, at Hustle Fund that the team is working on some very interesting ideas and we're just curious, our goal is to just write the check immediately, a small $25,000 angel check, which is small relative to the size of our fund and begin working with the teams. So I care more about seeing what execution is like for the given company at the, given, at the, at the current time and, and making our own judgment as to whether this is a team that, that can hustle. So just be really clear about hustle. As I mentioned, it's like great execution meets high velocity. Um, there's like a pejorative term around hustle, which is like around hustle porn, like this idea that you have to work like a thousand hours you know, a week or whatever. Um, and then like, and just like grit it through. <clears throat> now, I do, I do think that running a company, you're, you're going to work harder than like working at most corporate settings in, in, in many cases, but that's not hustle for us. Hustle for us is more smart work. It's more just like, it just seems that this guy, John, like whatever one hour of unit of work he puts in, he seems to be getting like 10 X more output than anyone else we meet. Right. And, and you just start to see this in the course of executing with, with, with the best teams. It's just like for every unit of our work they're putting in, they're just so organized, good at measurement. And just like, it, it just seems like they can get more cycles of experimentation and learning done than other teams that we might be supporting. So that's hustle for me. Um, I, so, you know, I work less, I think, than I did as a founder, but I think I work so much more smart that I feel like my, my output is greater than it's ever been in this current capacity, knowing what I know now. Right. So, um, that, that kind of is, uh, I think a, a very important distinction between like personal angel investing where 
frankly, the constraint is like, I only have so much money, so I can't like write like these exploratory checks and then just be, <laughs> and then just like, you know, have reserves for big follow on. Like I, I just, I don't have enough capital to do that. At a fund, it's a little bit different though, right? Because we've modeled it out like this, it gives us this opportunity to be a little bit less critical if we don't have as much evidence of previous hustle that's as clear, uh, where we can just try it out. And then we can get the answers that we want after that first check. This is what makes hustle fund so weird is just uh, that we we have chosen to defer our due diligence, not before we write the check, but after. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting and uh, a very unique strategy from the from the hustle fund perspective, which for me, I guess I have somewhat of a similar strategy. Not you know, I don't have the the capacity to be able to write those early checks and you know validate the founders. But what I tend to do is before I decide to invest, I actually let me make an introduction for you. Let me let me mm. let me introduce you to this person and. I also, it, it provides me with an opportunity just to observe at the very macro level, how they operate, yeah. how they actually take that introduction, how they follow up, how they deal with that. A lot of times it's the, such a simple exercise, but it's so revealing in the sense how you basically handle something that, you know, that came your way of potential value. So that's just kind of one of my examples of kind of trying to validate those early indicators from the, from the founder perspective. I think that's super smart. Right? I mean, like if I, if I were to just focus on angel investing only, <clears throat> like I didn't have a job or anything, I just wanted to do that. I think I'd probably pursue your strategy too, which is maybe I can't write exploratory check, but can I like try to find a way of collaborating with them for some period of time, adding a little bit of value up front. Um, and then it's essentially kind of the light version of what we do at Hustle Fund, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And and that might give you some more clues. And And like, here's the other side of it too, which is it's actually great for the founders as well because they actually actually know what they're getting themselves into is uh, seeing like, what is it like to collaborate with John? Is he actually really quick to respond? Does he seem friendly? Is he like really like supporting our ideas? Um, that is de-risking you to the founders. And that just builds a wonderful flywheel effect because they're going to tell their other founder friends and deal flow just grows. And um, you know, your brand is, gets more and more established. It's, it's a really good way of doing business. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that analogy. And you've mentioned a little bit towards the end of your response in terms of when it comes to productivity. There's a framework that Naval speaks a lot about. So, well, not a lot, but he, he mentioned something of a concept kind of, I guess, working as a lion versus working as a cow, which for our listeners, it's basically lions, lions, you know, cow, mo most people work as, as cows, not, not in a figurative way, but, you know, nine to five chewing that low nutrient grass day in, day out, you know, kind of that, that's, you know, stability and things that, you know, from that perspective, nothing negative. Um, but from founders and great CEOs, a lot of them operate as lions where they, they observe a lot. They, they look at, you know, whatever, different trends and things like that. And when they see an opportunity, they sprint. And they pull in, put in that 110% effort into that. They get that done. They don't rest until that's completed. Yeah. Um, I see a lot in a lot of founders kind of that distinction between being productive versus being very busy. Because yeah. for me, I struggled with that for many years. And you mentioned something that as a founder, and I found myself that just busyness and having a lot going on does not produce results at the end of at the end of the day but working extremely smart yeah. from that perspective completely different framework tell us a little bit more about that process how how do you stay yeah. disciplined from that standpoint where a lot of times i catch myself in front of my computer and i'm like fuck what did i do for the last yeah. three hours <laughs> time just flew by i didn't get anything done and i had yeah. all these like great ideas to to execute and i don't know like where things went so these days i just focus on one thing that i want to get done and if i yeah. do that i'm happy that's um, great so just share with us your uh, your framework uh, from that perspective. Yeah, a lot of things are coming to mind as you're uh, setting up this question. And you know, it, for us too, just as, as guys that have families, uh, for any moms and dads out there, it just feels like the pressure is even higher, right. which is just like, for me, the big number every day is 5.30 p.m. So that's when my nanny is gone. <laughs> and like, you know, when my kids are gonna be back at school, like I have to pick up my daughter from like her, her after school program. I cannot be late. I get charged $10 a minute every time I'm late. So like, you know, it's like, what can I get done before 5.30 PM? Which is very different from early twenties, Eric, which is like, yeah, I'll work until like 1 AM every night. I don't care, right? Uh, which maybe gave me an excuse to be less disciplined 
too. So um, when you're sharing that amazing analogy from Naval, it actually brought up one of my favorite posters that I used to see in the wall at Facebook. So Facebook, when you're working there, they have these like propaganda posters that have sayings like move fast, break things and all that stuff. My favorite poster, which I wish I had stolen and brought home with was uh, don't mistake motion for progress. And it's actually a picture of a rocking horse, right? Don't mistake motion for progress. And I was like, damn, that is like a really good summary for many periods of my life. I love that. Uh, when I was struggling as a founder, right? I was like, I felt like I was moving, but nothing was actually progressing at all. So I think the what I discovered from the very best founders that we worked with and the skill that I'm trying to hone myself is it comes down to measurement. So like my favorite question that I ask for founders when I'm talking to them first time is like, what are you trying to measure in this phase of your business and why, right? And it's a very non-judgmental question. Sometimes it's very like obvious, like uh, revenue or something. We're just like trying to like get a lot of revenue and that's fine. Uh, other times though, it's a little bit less obvious. It's like number of lines of code committed every day, right? And then just like uh, trying to distill like, why do you think that actually represents progress for you is really enlightening. Like I might disagree with it, but sometimes actually the founders are right and I'm wrong. Um, so I, I just tend to find that in terms of the pattern match that I get really excited about with founders during our growth pay phase, after we've written that first check, we're trying to decide whether they're, they're the right kind of hustlers for us. It's like, they're just so good about measurement, trying to identify and direct the team towards like the single goal uh, that they're trying to push week after week, month after month, year after year, or usually, or week after week, month after month, sometimes it evolves quite a bit as well, but also instrumentation. So this is actually the other side of measurement, which is like, how, okay, now that we established that you want to measure this, how are you capturing inputs? Uh, and like, where are you exposing this on the dashboard to show like whether things are moving in the right direction? This is uh, the difference between like some of the great founders and those who are just like kind of good. It's just like, they're really, really good at just capturing the right kind of inputs mm -hmm. to make sure that it's a unified dashboard. Everyone's super clear on what the objective is and like all activities can kind of naturally flow from that. Um, one thing that kind of inspires me about like thinking like this is actually the US military. So I'm not like a veteran or anything like that. I have some friends in the military, but the way that I understand like the command structure was really cool. It's like, you got the general, you got these things. Someone above you is always setting an objective, but they're never actually really telling you how to do it, right? If it's like, you know, John's telling me like, you got to go capture that hill right now. You're not micromanaging and say like, like three people here, three people there, like, you know, artillery there, machine gun here. It's, it's like, they're, they're letting the, the, the rest of the team kind of have the autonomy to actually make their own decisions, but the objective is always singular and clear, right? And this metaphor doesn't quite always work in startups because it tends to be a little more flat, but, but I think like uh, the objective being like a measurement that we all agree we care about um, tends to just align a lot of the how questions after that. Mm -hmm. Just like, well, you know, it's on you to just kind of figure it out, but like we know by the end of the week, we want to be here. And if it's not, then we're going to have a discussion about like, what, what did we learn? Like, why didn't it work? And so forth. So those are kinds of things that when I can see those kinds of activities happening and those kinds of discussions and that kind of passion happening in these, uh, in these phases when we're working really heavily with the teams, I get very souls usually on like, man, this is a exciting team to work with. Or, or maybe a, a bit different litmus test is like, I think I would like to work on this with this team if I didn't have this job. That's usually like a really good personal litmus test for me. Yeah. No, for sure. And that very last point resonates on so many levels, because for me, every time I meet just anybody, uh, whether that's a founder or just any acquaintance, any type of introduction, for me, it's always in the back of my mind is, is this someone I would want to work with? Is this someone that yeah. I would want to partner with? And just having, I don't know what it is, but having that framework of mind, to, not so much of evaluating that particular person, but How's the conversation structured and what the type of relationships really forming out of this? For me, that's always very interesting. And um, so to shift gears a little bit, you know, on you, you guys recently came out, announced uh, Angel Squad, which, you know, that, that when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is super cool. This is, this is insane. Well, just yesterday, uh, we made that announcement. So very yeah, timely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, guys made a lot of noise with that with a lot of, you know, publication and everything coming out. So, you know, that's, I was super excited to ask you yeah. about this, I guess, to the extent that you can share. What's, um, what's the vision behind kind yeah. of this, this program? What's, what's the objective there? Share with us uh, your thoughts. Certainly. Thank you for raising this too, John, because this is a, a program that we're enormously proud of here at Hustle Fund. So 
Angel Squad is essentially a, an educational and investment platform for new angels to be trained on our style of early stage investing. So it's, it's meant really for those who are early in their angel careers who want to start to build, as I mentioned this term a lot, mental models of how Hustle Fund approaches great founders. And, and um, so it's part education. I think it's also part deals. So we offer opportunities for uh, Angel Squad members who are new to, to the practice to also participate in the exact same deals that we're writing checks into out of our main fund. So with our own portfolio founders. So it's a little bit of vetting, like site handholding. And then the last part is the community. This is the part I'm the most proud of. Uh, com the community is really diverse. It's really inclusive and full of wonderful human beings. Right now it's 46% women, 9% underrepresented. We want to increase those numbers uh, in both realms. But it also includes just folks from a lot of walks of life. It's not just tech workers, but doctors, lawyers from the professions, traditional ind industry people, those who are working in oil and gas and so forth, professional athletes too. Those that want to bring their unique experiences and, and start their careers as angel investors. So why? You know, why, why would we do this? Um, there's already a zillion angel clubs out there. So why, why does Hustle Fund want to create the squad in this kind of dynamic? It actually comes down to, I think, a very key principle that guides their fund. As I mentioned, like this mantra earlier that great hustlers look like anyone and come from anywhere. We're enormously proud of like the diverse set of founders that we're supporting at Hustle Fund. You know, and, and our way, and for us is directly tied to capitalism. Like it's just like support a wide set of founders who are incredibly talented, regardless of what they look like or where they come from or what their backgrounds are. And let's make a shit ton of money that way. But there's a big problem that we're starting to notice with these amazing founders is that when you look at their cap tables, they don't find anyone, especially if you come from like a like a like underrepresented or female background. Like they don't find people that look like them on the cap table. It's overwhelmingly men, overwhelmingly tech men, overwhelmingly white and Asian men. I mean, no knock on folks like me or you that like you know can still be good people and add a lot of value. But there's something to be said when you can't find someone who looks just like yourself, who's investing in you. Because that, that's just creating another kind of implicit barrier of, of being able to be safe and comfortable, right? Like, you know, um, I, I just, I, I can't deny that, like, there's a reality of being, let's say, like a black female founder in America that I just will never fully understand, right? There's just, it's just like a, a two layers of uh, discrimination and like, like life experiences that is so different from what I have. And there are just these moments where it's important maybe to talk to a black female investor you know, who's gone through that journey, understands, I think, how to speak um, through, through some of those truths and that shared experiences to help those founders. So our view is that, you know, we think we're doing a, a pretty good job, always can be better, but a pretty good job in serving a, a diverse and inclusive set of founders. But wouldn't it be great if we could also build a squad full of diverse and inclusive investors to also serve on these cap tables? And oh, by the way, I think the last part about like Angel Squad here is like, one of, I think, the big lies of early stage angel investing that has become like an institutional norm is like you have to be like a, a tech worker in Silicon Valley uh, that works at a Google or Facebook. You know, like the, there's like this sort of idea that's formed somehow that like that kind of person should be an angel investor. And if you're like a lawyer in Ohio who might be sex, successful in your own realm and, and like have different phenotypes, you're, you know, underrepresented or like a woman or something like that. Um, you don't get to play. And that is a completely false narrative. And I would argue that there, that person whom I'm actually thinking about in real life in the squad has a lot to offer. Like it's a, a complete, it's like, she's out of the bubble, right? Like she's not working in, within Silicon Valley, like, or in tech. Um, there's a lot of fresh ideas, new network that she can provide to founders. And she deserves to have a spot as an angel investor in this game. So I think that's kind of like, it's an extension of the broader mission of inclusivity tied to capitalism uh, that we're really excited about. And the program has been running in stealth since January. We have 150 participants. We're adding 75 every quarter. It's turned into this really, really cool safe spot too, where we can be really vulnerable with each other, share lots of ideas, deals, not feel too much judgment because we're all in different stages of our journey together. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, very proud that we could announce that yesterday, May 10th, 2021. Um, and it's, uh, I think one of the biggest things that we've launched in the history of hustle fund. Wow. That's super cool. Uh, you know, that's so exciting at the end of the day, it's 
um, part of the reasons why you know I actually got involved in just angel investing all all together yeah. is uh, I wish kind of much earlier in my career I understood the value of just whether that's angel investor or venture capital space yeah uh, and it's just kind of a way to really build wealth in in America at the end of the yeah. day it's something that for immigrants it's not so you know there's not this clear democratization to you know yeah. access to that type of information at the end of the day so that's also you know i i see you know just my head spinning from all kinds of angles from like the really the the mission and the objective that you're trying to build with angel squad which is you know super exciting they, you know that's 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 we you know we can probably talk about this uh <laughs> another episode just completely all about that particular topic um but eric in in conclusion share with us your content diet what do you allow your mind to be exposed to on daily basis outside of just talking to a lot of investors and founders and things like that what are what are the different sources that you consume for self-actualization and learning <laughs> well um yeah thank you for that question it's a remarkably complicated one so i'm spinning a little bit too uh thinking through it you know one thing that uh is maybe surprising to people is how little I read, just generally. Uh, so uh, I, I like to kind of like go very deep into first principles thinking. And when it comes to at least like the, the craft, this business, um, there's a very specific kind of business that I like to support. It's those founders and businesses that, were, that have the goal of becoming a going concern. So a definition of a going concern to me is very simple. It's like more money is gonna come in than leaves, right? And it just sort of repeats and grows like that. That's like my entire definition of business, more money coming in than actually exiting, right? So when it comes to like the, the business models and so forth, I need to have like a five-year-old's understanding of the business model. And usually like if I can explain it to my now six-year-old, he just turned six, then um, we're, we're, we're generally on the right path here. Like it's not terribly exotic and so forth. So I'm, I'm pretty good about avoiding things that I should probably be paying attention to like most blockchain. I just don't really understand the business models just yet. and um, Definitely a lot of the more kind of um, very complicated uh, consumer kinds of uh, businesses are trying to be created where the monetization is a little bit unclear to me. I avoid that stuff. Now, I also don't read very much business books. I did a lot of that in my 20s. And then I kind of switched into audiobooks and then I stopped. Um, instead, I kind of came to a conclusion on something that I just personally want to get better at over time, which is storytelling. So in my journey, you know, in my 20s, the big revelation that you may have actually I've heard to or experience John was just like everything is sales right at, at some point you just conclude like it's not just like me trying to get money from John sales but it's like convincing you know head of product John to believe in the vision get sold on it get excited about it understand like what his truth is and his objectives are so we can try to align together right good listening good sales right and then in my 30s I discovered a higher order principle it's like well yeah everything is kind of sales but maybe actually the, the bigger first principle behind there is everything is storytelling. You know, like how, how do I actually like really understand John's experiences immigrating from Kazakhstan, like, you know, having career success in, in Florida and like, you know, building his practice there and, and seeing whether th my story can actually align with his more naturally so that we can do more together. And for me, the highest order, uh, uh, I guess, medium of storytelling is actually stand up comedy. I do a lot. I don't practice it myself. I don't, I'm maybe a little too afraid to get in front of a stage and like tell my shitty dad jokes, but I love, love, love studying stand up comedy. Here's the reason why. Um, generally, like when you're getting going, it's like a five minute set. But when you see a perfect five minute set by a stand up comedian who has nothing except a microphone in front of her or him and just telling your story, and then you find yourself utterly engaged, you find that they take you through a very, very big journey. And then it ends. And you're like, oh my gosh, like what just happened in those last five minutes, right? That, that was like, that was like a magical moment there. So, you know, I really love uh, uh, Dave Chappelle right now. He's got like a, he's an incredible comedian. He's early gifted, but late stage Dave Chappelle is really fascinating too, because he's becoming a really strong social critic, talks about very, very difficult issues, but, and, and like has become like both very cynical, but really funny. And I think that like his like, his world of just like the stories he tells is enormous. I really like earlier Kevin Hart. I think that he took so much in terms of lessons of vulnerability and making fun of himself. So watching lots of stand-up comedy is something that I love to do. 
in addition to that too, reading books on stand-up comedy. So I highly recommend Kevin Hart's biography. I can't make this up. He goes really deep into his history, but also like the craft of how he creates jokes. I thought it was unbelievable. Like one of the best like business books I've ever read in my life was just like, this is how this guy actually breaks down good storytelling. Um, so watch that. And then all the rest is just kind of like Netflix with my wife and you know, it's just chilling out with my family. On Netflix, the last thing I'll start to share is I've really gotten into F1. So the F1 series, uh, Driving to Survive, uh, or, is, or I think that's what it's called, it's incredible. Oh my gosh. I mean, like there's so many good stories in F1, like the characters, the drivers, the politics of the, the, the manufacturers and the teams. Um, it, it's almost like the watching uh, uh, WWE wrestling, but in real life. Uh, so I, I just enormously look forward to that in the evenings, watching that with my wife. She's now hooked into it too. So that's a little bit of a preview of my content diet, but it's, it's not terribly well formed. <laughs> oh, wow. You dude, you just killed that, killed that question <laughs> from a perspective of completely different, uh, you know, framework to look at a content diet in general. And I love the, I love the whole analogy or, uh, you utilizing stand-up comedy, uh, as kind of that the foundation for understanding this, the art of storytelling, because at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's at the core of any sales or persuasion sure. or negotiation and all of that, you know, that's, uh, that resonates on so many levels and definitely going to make, um, the titles of the books that you've mentioned in the show notes. Uh, Eric, I want to go on for the next two, three hours uh, <laughs> for us to, to riff on a lot of that other great stuff. And I, I personally learned quite a bit from this very short conversation and really appreciate your time today that you made for us and shared a lot of the great insights. What I like to do with a lot of my guests is actually host them again on the show in about a year and see how much have changed and transpired uh, through that period and see, hey, this is what we, you and I discussed. Does that still make sense or we're just completely retarded? So those are just very good retrospective sessions that I like to host. So definitely looking forward to that uh, with you. Yeah, thank you, John, for this opportunity to sit with you with Ivy Podcast. You're a fantastic interviewer. I'm happy to have a debrief session with you in a year to see whether I was completely bullshitting you or not. Um, but no, I really enjoy this conversation. I think you're providing an excellent service to founders, to this entire ecosystem, and um, talking about some of these topics, which I think historically has been a real black box for founders in terms of like how do VC operate, like what, what's the journey like on our side of things, um, hopefully providing some clues also to founders for how they can connect better with their investors over time. So thank you so much for all your good work as well. Oh, that's awesome. And I think we've achieved just that from the perspective of really shining more light on how the, you know, the history on VC and all of that's operating as an actual startup. I think that's such a, like you've mentioned, is underrepresented when it comes to information availability from that standpoint. So that's super cool. Eric, thanks so much, man. We're going to be in touch and, uh, and uh, you know, looking forward to uh, staying connected. That sounds great. All the best to you, John. And thanks again for this opportunity.